In 58 BC, Hyus Julius Caesar, under the pretext of helping the tribes allied with Rome, orders his legions to march into Gaul. He managed to conquer this country in just a few years, but success was not complete. One after another, uprisings broke out in different parts of Gaul. All of them were ruthlessly crushed by his legions. When it seemed that Gaul was finally subdued, a new uprising broke out under the leadership of Vercingetorix, the chieftain of the Arverni tribe. In a matter of weeks, the rebellion swept almost all of Gaul. The critical moment of the uprising was the Battle of Gergovia. Caesar sent Titus Labienus, his most trusty legate with four legions, to the north to pacify the local tribes. With his main forces, Caesar remained in central Gaul to stand against Vercingetorix. By that time, almost all the Gallic people joined the rebellion. Vercingetorix employed a scorched earth strategy. His detachments devastated the lands along the path of Caesar's army and attacked his foragers. The main base of the rebels was the city of Gergovia. In June 52 BC, Caesar tried to take Gergovia, but the assault turned into a disaster. The Romans suffered severe losses and had to retreat. His success at Gergovia convinced Vercingetorix of the correctness of his strategy. The key to his success was the cavalry advantage. He managed to gather under his command about 15,000 horsemen. Flying detachments of the Gallic cavalry followed the Roman troops and tried to prevent the collection of forage and cut off food supplies. He believed that the Romans would soon be forced to return to Italy to avoid starvation. After the failure at Gergovia, Caesar sent a messenger to Labienus with the order to reunite with the main army. He himself went to the north to meet him. Their troops met at the town of Agedincum nearby modern Paris. Realizing that he could not deal with highly mobile Gallic cavalry, Caesar recruited allied German cavalry. Meanwhile, the Allobroges, one of the largest Gallic tribes that lived on the border of Roman lands and Gaul, joined the rebellion. The Allobroges created the defensive line along the banks of the Rhone and completely cut off Caesar from supplies and reinforcements from Italy. In addition, they began to raid the Roman provinces. Upon hearing this, Caesar decided to move southward to take a position from which he could fight against Vercingetorix and assist the border provinces. Vercingetorix thought his plan had worked and the Romans were finally fleeing to Italy. He wanted to capitalize on his success, so he ordered to attack the marching Roman column with the cavalry alone, without infantry support. Before the attack, the Gallic horsemen swore not to return home unless they went through the Roman column twice. The next day, the Gallic horsemen split into three detachments and attacked the Roman forces. The convoy stopped, the legionaries formed a defensive formation around the supply carts, and the German horsemen, with the support of the infantry, engaged the Gallic cavalry. For a long time, the battle was equal, until finally, the Germans on the right flank managed to break one of the Gallic detachments. Seeing the defeat of their comrades, two other groups of Gauls fearing the encirclement also fled. Vercingetorix expected an easy victory from this raid, and this outcome forced him to switch from attack to defense. He moved his army to the city of Alesia, the capital of the Mandubi tribe. He hoped to provoke the Romans into an assault and repeat his success at Gergovia. The fortress of Alesia was located on a steep hill surrounded by rivers on both sides. The fortress was built using so-called Murus Gallicus technology. First, they laid a row of logs or wooden beams about half a meter from each other. The gaps between the logs were filled with rocks and earth. Then they laid a new row of logs at the right angle to the previous one and filled it with rocks. The builders repeated this pattern until they got a wall several meters thick and four to six meters high. At the top of the wall they usually raised a palisade. But defeat at Gergovia taught Caesar a lesson. He decided not to storm Malaysia. Instead, he commanded to pitch a camp and begin the siege works. He ordered Alesia to be surrounded by a line of fortifications to prevent any attempts to supply the city with food. Seeing these works, the Gauls sent a cavalry squad to attack the workers, but they were met by cavalry led by Titus Labienus. Seeing this, Caesar sent the German cavalry to help them. 
He also lined up the legions in battle formation, in case of a sudden attack by the Gallic infantry. Soon, the Gauls could not withstand the onslaught by the Germans and started to flee. The Germans pursued them to the very entrance of the city. The retreating horsemen could not go through the narrow gates all at once, and the area in front of the gates got overcrowded. Seeing the flight of the enemy, Caesar ordered the legions to advance. Panic broke out among the Gauls in the city. Vercingetori, fearing that the Romans might break into the fortress, called the gates to be closed. A massacre started at the gates. Many Gallic riders dismounted and tried climbing the fence, hoping to escape from Roman and German swords. In this clash, the Gauls lost almost all of their cavalry. Vercingetori realized that he could not prevent the construction of the Roman fortifications. He gathered the remaining horsemen and ordered them to break through the ring of Roman fortifications, which was still not closed, and go to the allied Gallic tribes with a call for help. Caesar learned about this from defectors and captured Gauls. Therefore, he immediately ordered the construction of the second line of fortifications to defend against the forces of the Gauls coming to the aid of besieged fortress. The Roman fortifications had the following structure. First, they dug two moats 4.5 meters deep and wide. The earth extracted from the moats formed a rampart. The inner moat was filled with water supplied by nearby rivers. At the top of the rampart, the soldier built a 4 meter high palisade. Towers for archers were erected every 25 meters. Outside the fortifications, the legionaries also dug several rows of trenches at the bottom of which there were a lot of sharpened sticks and eight rows of wolf pits with sharp stakes inside. The inner line of fortification was 16 kilometers long and the outer one was almost 21 kilometers long. By construction completion, hunger began to spread in Alesia. At the military council, Gauls decided to expel women, children, elderly people and everyone unable to bear arms from the city. Vercingetorix hoped that the Romans would enslave and spend part of the food supplies on them. Still, Caesar strictly forbade anyone to pass beyond the line of the Roman fortifications. The people expelled from Alesia were left to starve, locked between two lines of walls. Meanwhile, the messengers sent by Vercingetorix reached their destination. The leaders of the Gallic tribes gathered the militia and moved to the rescue of the besieged Alesia. According to Caesar, the total size of the army that came to the aid of Vercingetori was a quarter of a million warriors, 250,000 infantry and 8,000 cavalry. Modern estimates are much more modest, but the Gauls greatly outnumbered the Romans in any case. The Gauls pitched a camp on a hill about a mile away from the Roman line of fortifications. After this, a Gallic cavalry squad supported by archers and light infantry advanced to the plains between the camp and the Roman fortifications. Caesar sent out the Germans to meet them, and a fierce battle started. Gauls in Alesia noticed that the help had arrived. This caused a massive uplift of morale among the defenders of the besieged fortress. Vercingetorix led the troops out of the city, lined them up in front of the Roman fortifications, and prepared to lead them to a breakthrough if the battle would be successful on the other side of the walls. Despite the relentless rain of arrows, the Germans managed to regroup, take an advantageous position and overrun the Gallic cavalry. Gaul riders fled the battlefield, leaving the archers, who had advanced too far from the camp and protected. Seeing the defeat of their brothers in arms, the Gauls returned to the fortress. The next day, passed in preparations for the siege of the outer Roman fortifications. By night, Gauls launched a massive attack. On this wall section, the legatus Marcus Antonius and Gaius Tribunius were in charge of the Roman forces. They organized the defense by sending reinforcements to the places where the Romans had the hardest time. Seeing that their allies had gone to the assault, Vercingetorix also ordered his forces to attack the same sector of the Roman fortifications. Still, his advance was delayed by wolf pits and moats. By the time the army of Vercingetori reached the Roman fortifications, Antonius and Tribonius had already repelled the onslaught of the Gauls from the outside. Seeing that the joint attack had failed, the Gauls retreated behind the walls of Alesia. The next day, the Gauls regrouped and attacked the Romans simultaneously along the entire perimeter of the outer fortifications. The main force of the Gauls struck from the northeast. A large hill located there gave them a high ground advantage. 
seeing the beginning of the battle, Vercingetorix also moved his forces out of Alesia and attacked the inner fortifications. Everyone realized that it was the last decisive stand. The Romans had nowhere to retreat. The superior forces of the Gauls were advancing from all sides. The Roman defense would crumble if only the Gauls managed to break through behind the Roman palisade. But the Gauls also were in a desperate situation. Food had run out several days ago in besieged Alesia, so the Gauls had no choice but to break through the Roman defenses. The alternative was slavery or death from starvation. The situation was desperate. Caesar moved 40 additional cohorts to the North Seas. He himself was among the soldiers, cheering and inspiring them. Titus Labienus was in charge of the defense of this section of the world. When it became clear that a breakthrough of the Gauls was imminent, he conceived a desperate counterattack with four cohorts of infantry and all the remaining cavalry. Having learned about this plan, Caesar led the cavalry's charge. Caesar's detachment climbed the hill behind the attacking Gauls and, using the high ground advantage, fell upon the Gauls. The Gauls suddenly found themselves between two fires. The Romans on the palisade saw what was happening. They were inspired and doubled their pressure on the attackers. The Gauls, on the contrary, panicked. Their formation collapsed and they began to flee, but few managed to escape death that day. Seeing the defeat of their best forces, the Gauls stopped the siege and fled. The Romans were able to switch to the defense of the inner wall and quickly managed to push the attackers back and drive the remaining Gauls behind the walls of Alesia. The victory was complete. Alesia surrendered the following day. Romans captured around 40,000 Gallic warriors and Caesar enslaved all of them, except Edui and Arverni. By letting them go, Caesar hoped he would win the loyalty of the largest tribes of the Gaul. Caesar took Vercingetorix to Rome. There, the captive leader of the Gauls spent five years in prison, waiting for the triumph of Caesar. During the triumph, he was again dressed in his armor, placed in a cage, and driven through the streets of Rome. After the triumph, Vercingetorix was strangled, but Caesar did not survive him for long. Less than a year after Vercingetorix's death, Caesar fell, slain by the daggers of the conspirators.